Let's pray and let's let's uh, kick this thing off. Thank you so much, God, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought us together. Thank you that you've given us this space. Thank you that you, you're building us into this beautiful spiritual family. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to be brought together, each one of us, to form your body. Thank you that we are called the bride of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that we are waiting expectantly for your return. You're coming back. And you're going to come back and celebrate with us and embrace us and love us and bring us into our, our station that we were created for completely and holy in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we submit our will, our rights, and all control to you this morning. With all the authority you've given us, we take authority over the atmosphere around us in your name. We bind silence and separate every voice and assignment from the enemy. And we loose your power might, wisdom, revelation, knowledge, counsel, and holy reverence over us and this space in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare that this is holy ground with an H, and everything that we are and everything that we have, we wholly give to you with a W. Thank you, Lord. This is your space. Surround us and keep us. Put your wing over us and and keep us under your shadow, guarded. And I pray that you would surround this property with your angels. We command every enemy intention to be confused in the name of Jesus Christ. Every enemy voice to be silenced in the name of Jesus. And right now we are in your God bubble meeting in your living room. Father God, come and enjoy us, Father. Holy Spirit, move among us. Reveal, reveal the heart of God to us and grow us as your children, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This week we had the opportunity to see Luna and Israel, who are our graduates, playing their very last high school orchestra concert. And in the end of the concert, they had all the seniors stand on the front of the stage and play. One of the cool things to see was that Luna walks out on the stage and stands in front. And then Israel comes in and stands right next to her. And to see the two of them standing next to each other as spiritual siblings in our house. And knowing that they've been through this and they've been able to grow together and they're graduating together. And then also to have Ella and Noah there celebrating with us as our spiritual family. Celebrating with Luna as she's, and Israel as they're moving into a new season in life. It's really cool. It's really cool. But I use this as a picture because I really thought this is also a great illustration Uh, These relationships would not exist the way they do without spiritual family. And we're going to talk about baptism. And I want you guys to get this. Every time you hear the word baptism, you hear these two words. Soaked and transformed. Because that's what every form of baptism is talking about. Soaked and transformed. We're going to talk about that more. The kids, uh, and they've been going through a series that I, I wrote for the adults. And we've already done it like three times here in Wellspring on Wednesday nights. And I've talked about it many times on Sundays. It's called Building Blocks. In building blocks, we talk, we're talking about the basic foundational truth. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word also means maturity. That means grow up, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So we have these six things listed here. And it, prior to this, and then continuing in this letter to the Hebrews, whoever wrote this letter is correcting Hebrew believers and saying, guys, you need to grow up. And he actually says, you guys, I want to share with you deep spiritual things. I want to share with you meat, but you're still stuck in milk. You need the milk. And he says that the milk are the six things that are listed here. We have repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. These are the six baby milk things. These are the things you should get right when you become a believer. Get into them, understand them, have your own faith and position in them, and move on. Now, if you live 80 years on this earth, how many of those 80 years are you supposed to be breastfeeding? Thank you. Really, traditionally, by the time they move, they are what we call weaned. Is Once they're moving, they're moving on. And as Christians, we're supposed to get these six things and have a full understanding of them and a faith in them. And once we start moving with God, after about a year of your faith, you should be ready to move on and go to meaty things. But unfortunately, we often don't. We often don't even get past maybe the first one.
If we're lucky, the second one. The third one, well, I don't know. We'll talk about one baptism, but I don't know about that plural thing. And then laying out of hands, okay, we're getting weird. We're done. So most of the church, I'd say, wouldn't even accept the full milk. So of course they're never going to get the meat. I want to go through together, and I know I'm not going to be doing them justice, but I want to give us a, a main basic understanding that we can all agree on, on three baptisms. And these three baptisms are distinct, and yet they are one in many ways. You remember the scripture, Matthew 28, 18, 20? We call this the Great Commission. And it says, Then Jesus came close to them and said, All of the authority of the universe has been given to me. Now, wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to fearfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. And many of us know this scripture. But it's amazing how often we glaze over that one statement right here because we don't really have a full understanding of baptism. I believe if you have a full understanding of what that word means, it changes everything else about this scripture. It brings a whole nother level of revelation, a whole nother depth of understanding about what Jesus Christ is telling us. He's not saying go dunk people in water and by the way, make sure you say these three things to make it official, which I've seen people fight about. He's saying something much deeper here. So let's talk about baptism, okay? The word baptize, the reason it wasn't translated, the Greek word is baptizo, is because it would politically stir things up in the church at the time when the first English translation was being made. Because at that time, the church believed in uh, a sprinkling babies. And scripturally, there's, no, there's nothing in the Bible that says that's the way you're supposed to do things. And so they were afraid if they translated baptize correctly, that it would stir up the church and cause problems. Just like uh, the fact that they didn't translate uh, bishop because they had a position they'd already created for the bishop. So they didn't want to stir things up by actually translating. It just means overseer. Bishop, pastor, shepherd, those are all the same thing. There's no layer on top of layer on top of layer. That just didn't exist. But if they translated it, then it would undermine the structure that they created. So instead of translating baptizo, they just made it into baptize. So they could call it whatever they want because nobody knew what that meant. But the word baptize is actually in the Greek baptizo and it comes from the word bapto and it means to cover wholly with fluid. In Luke 16, 24, it's translated as dip. Dip the tip of his finger in water. John 13, 26, a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Revelations 19, 13, a robe dipped in blood. Again, Strong's, this is Strong's exhaustive concordance, and it says to cover wholly with fluid. Biblical dipping is not a conservative dipper. <laughs> Biblical dipping is not a double dipper. Mm. Biblical dipping is the guy that you don't want by the queso bowl. If he's doing a biblical dipping, his chip is going all the way in, and it's coming out totally transformed by the cheese. <laughs> and that's the way I am today, the reason I am the way I am. I have been totally transformed by the cheese. In ancient Greece, the word baptizo, it was used in culture for dyeing cloth. They would take the cloth, they would, it would be completely one way, you put it in the dye, the dye soaks in, you take it out, it's been completely, two words, soaked and transformed. That's what baptizo means. That's what baptize means. It'd be great if we could just go through the Bible and take out that word baptize all together and replace it with soaked and transformed. And when you guys read the Bible, I want you to do that in your heads. See the word soaked. See the word immersed. I want you to see a sponge squeezed, put in there, released, soaked up completely and pulled out, transformed by what it was dipped in. That's baptizo. So everybody say it with me. Soaked and transformed. Soaked and transformed. Okay. That's what biblical baptism means. Now, those three types of baptism that we're going to talk about today, and I'm just going to lay them out for you, and then we're going to get a little bit more in depth in each one. The first one is baptism into Jesus. In Acts 38, uh, 2.38, we'll see the scripture in a moment. It says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 19.5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The second one, baptism into the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, you guys remember the story? He came back and he said, now you guys wait right here till I give you what you need. I'm going to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything. Don't leave here. You stay right here until I come and do this. He says, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then number three, baptism in the church. And you guys know I love this idea. That's why Wellspring, we consider Wellspring an interactive, immersive community. 
You are immersed in Jesus Christ. You are immersed in the Holy Spirit, but don't ever lose. And what we need to be driving into and be intentional about is being immersed in a spiritual family. That's what this is talking about. Each one of us were called to be part of a spiritual family. Jesus Christ died to create the spiritual family that God created in Eden, was lost to sin. The whole purpose was to bring us back into spiritual family Mm -hmm. because we are the sons of God, the daughters of God. And we lost that when sin came into the picture. So we are called, what are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love people. Bam, love God, love people. The greatest, that's greatest commandments. Love God, love people. That means the most numbered one and number two things, and and Jesus goes on to say that they are the same, so they're both the number one thing, is being in a group of people that you love God and love each other. That's the ultimate goal. If we were evolutionists, we would say that is the highest point of evolution. Mm -hmm. Loving God and loving one another. And we're all on this journey to grow in that and be intentional about it. That's what it means to be baptized into the church. The Holy Spirit immerses you into the body who places us according to the will of the Lord. It's not by chance that the doctrine of baptisms, we're going to talk first about the water baptism, baptism into Jesus. It's not by chance that it's number three on our list of six foundational ideas because these first two have to happen before you get there. When we're talking about baptism into Jesus, we're really talking about a a process of salvation. Each one of us is over here walking in dead works. That's why the first thing we have to learn is to repent from dead works. Repent means to turn around, transform, change the way you think. The cross is a giant U-turn sign saying, stop, you're on a path of death. Stop and turn around. When we see that, and then we respond by turning, not everybody does, but when we do, then we start going in number two. So we have repentance from dead works, faith toward God. And the direction of our life is then turned and we shifted and we walk towards the kingdom of God. This all happens. And then we step into water baptism. We're baptized in Christ because this whole journey only occurs immersed in Jesus. Accepting what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Jesus Christ died, right? When we look at the cross, we see the death of Jesus. But Jesus was then buried. He was officially dead and buried, right? But he didn't stay there, did he? He resurrected. So we see him dead on the cross, and we choose to accept him by faith, and we let our old life be buried, and we rise with him, and we only live walking this direction immersed in Jesus covered in resurrected Jesus, filled by resurrected Jesus. And that's what it means. It's not just an act of water. It means just like you're covered with the water, the old dead is the old you's dead, the new you comes out, you're living a new life. So all of you guys that are thinking about being water baptized, this is your statement to the world saying, I am no longer living for death, but I'm living for life. I am no longer living for darkness. That me is dead. My new life is in light. I am no longer living in rebellion. My life is now in submission. Hmm. Romans 6, 3, 4 says, Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And just in that scripture, we see three things happen. We died with Christ on the cross. We are buried with him and we are raised with him in resurrection. By taking hold of that in faith, we live a transformed life from that point on. Sometimes we have to remember that. I know it's John Wallace who told me one time to just remember if there's things you're struggling with, it might mean you need to have another funeral service. Mm. And uh, if, if you have something that you're struggling with in your life, it may be time to actually have a burial service. Take it out into your backyard, invite some friends over, dig a hole, take something that represents it, put it in the hole, say a few words, shed a few tears, it's dead. It's dead. Because we, when we struggle with things, it's because we haven't fully recognized and had the revelation that we're playing with dead stuff. That you is dead in the eyes of God. The enemy wants to say that, that you're a living dead as a giant zombie walking around falling apart. And that is not the case. In the spiritual, you are dead. The old you is dead. The old you that he influences, the enemy influences, and and has control in that life, it's dead. You still make mistakes. That's okay. 
that's when we turn back to God, repent, we turn back to God, we say, hey, God, I'm sorry. He says, it's okay. Come on, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. That old you is dead. It's not an issue. Okay. Repent and return to God. This is when the people are crying out to Peter right after the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's crazy things are going on. Peter gets up and preaches and a whole crowd of people come together and they say, what do we do? And he says, repent and return to God. Each one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, the anointed one, to have your sins removed. Then you may take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and return to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to have your sins removed and take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So next, let's talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm sorry, I'm not doing justice to these. The main point of this is just to shift our thinking about what baptism is and really embracing the idea of being soaked and transformed. So as shown in Acts 2.38, receiving the Holy Spirit comes from believing and being baptized, right? If these are three steps we're looking at, you repent, you believe, and you are baptized. This was important enough that Jesus told his followers to wait for it. Wait for it. Acts 1, 4 through 5 says, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Father, the promise of the Father, and he equates it to baptism in the Holy Spirit. So what exactly is the promise of the Father? John 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now listen to this. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. In both the scriptures that we just read, Jesus says the Father will send another what? Helper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Noah, can you just be my interpretive slide? <laughs> yes. So in both of those slides, he said, I am sending the helper. The Holy Spirit is not for the world, he also says, because they don't receive him, because the world doesn't see him and they don't know him. But he says, in order, Jesus says, in order to experience the Holy Spirit fully, you must believe the one who sent him, right? And you believe the Father sent him through the Son. So the Holy Spirit, as he says in that scripture, is for the disciples, followers of Jesus, like you and me. So is, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for you? Yes. yes. Is it for me? Yes. yes. It's for us. And it's necessary part, again, that Jesus said, wait for this. Get it. The Helper has three big purposes. John 16, 8 through 9 says, And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. First purpose of the helper is the, the word convict. And what does convict mean? Sounds like bring to account sense. Huh? To bring it to an account. Yeah. And oh, really, the word convict, I mean, you, it means that you feel, oh, wait, what I just did felt wrong. Right? That's kind of what, the way we can say conviction is, is there's a feeling inside of you that you suddenly realize that didn't feel right. And so when we are convicted, we have the opportunity to turn and change, right? So the Holy Spirit is the one that comes into the world to bring conviction. And there's another thing, when I translate convict in my head, the way that I translate it is the Holy Spirit helps us feel what God feels. If the Holy Spirit's not in us, we can continue going on a path. And everybody has a sense of right and wrong, typically. Most people do. But as we go along in lives and make enough bad decisions, eventually we stop feeling that way. So number one, the Holy Spirit helps us feel what God feels. Now number two is in John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, but will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. It says that. Isn't that cool? Wow, okay, so Jesus says the baptism of the Holy Spirit is you're going to be immersed, you're going to be soaked. What was one of the words that jumped out in that one? He guides. The Holy Spirit guides you and me into all truth. He speaks to us what God is saying, and sometimes he even speaks to us about what God intends to do. We get to have a conversation with God our Father. So we had convict. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, we feel what God feels. He guides us. When he guides us, 
The Holy Spirit helps us to know what God knows. So the Holy Spirit gives us God's feelings. He gives us God's knowing. Wow. And then Jesus adds this third one. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Power. And the way that I like to look at the idea of power, so we have convict. The Holy Spirit helps us feel what God feels. We have, what was the second one? Guide. Guide. The Holy Spirit helps us know what God knows. And then we have power. The Holy Spirit helps us do what God does. If we've been fully adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters of God, his desire is that we operate completely like him. He wants us as his children to be like him as an adult. Mm. So he wants us to feel the way he feels. He wants us to know the things that he knows. He wants us to do the things that he does. That's why we're his children. If he didn't have that intention, he would never have called us his children. So the Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses. And also Paul learned this the hard way. Um, A lot of us have been taught that the power of God is really just the ability to speak a great message and that will change the world. And you guys know from Paul's experience, he thought that for a little bit. He just kind of forgot. And he went and preached the greatest message of all time in the past 2,000 years besides Jesus himself. This is stated as one of the greatest messages recorded. And it's his message at Mars Hill preaching to the greatest minds of the time. And how many people got saved from that message? Zero. Paul tells the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 4.20, that the kingdom is not just words, but power. If the power of God isn't with you, it's pointless. But if the power of God is with you, You can give the worst message ever. There's hope. And your slide presentation can stop working. And everything can fall apart. And there's a fire thingy beeping in the background. (laughs) But God meets us. And God moves in our lives. And God does things among us. Mm -hmm. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So it was necessary for the disciples to be saturated in the Holy Spirit before going to tell the world. Baptism into the Holy Spirit. So... Have we got our three points? What's the first one? What does the Holy Spirit do? Uh, convict. Convicts. And what does convict mean? Make you feel what God feels. Thank you. <laughs> number two. Yeah. Yeah. Guide. And what does guide mean? No, no, no. Yes. And number three. Power. power. And what does power mean? Do awesome. Awesome. Now, one of these is not more important than the other. It's all three in a package together. This is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And thank God the Holy Spirit isn't a checklist. He doesn't go, okay, one, two, three. He goes, here it is. This is another thing that the Bible teaches us. There's the baptism experience of the Holy Spirit. But then we're supposed to continually be filled by the Holy Spirit. Continually being filled by the Holy Spirit. So we're constantly supposed to be overflowing with the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not a one-time experience. That's also awesome. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's never a checklist. You know, you're not supposed to spend your whole life in the pool uh, when it comes to water baptism. You're actually supposed to come out of the water baptism because there's the death and the resurrection. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, you are spending your whole life in the pool. That immersion is continual and constant and nonstop constant. Fill me up more. Fill me up. Overflow, 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 overflow. Galatians 3.27 says, It was faith that immersed you into Jesus, the anointed one, And now you are covered and clothed with his anointing. It was by faith that immersed you. This is the translation, the Passion Translation. It was by faith that immersed you into Jesus, the anointed one. And now you are covered and clothed with his anointing. These are all baptism words. Immersed, covered, clothed. And the key word there is by faith. All of this is operating by faith. When you're soaked and transformed in Jesus, he wants to soak you. And that last part, it says covered and clothed with his anointing. When they anointed, they used oil. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is saying, when you're covered in me through water baptism, you're also going to be covered with me and soaked by the anointing that is on me and in me. And that is the Holy Spirit. What verse was that? Uh, that was Galatians 3.27. And the the translation we read was the Passion Translation. It's a little bit different because a lot of the other translations use the anointed one and they use the word Christ, which means the anointed one, but instead they just translate it. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 through 14. 
Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body. This is our third one. By one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. So this is our third one. This aspect of baptism, unfortunately, you guys, I know I've been on my, I've been on my, my little soapbox a lot on this one. Because again, this is, this is the one that we overlook so much, especially in our culture of independence and maverick and island of one kind of mentality. Fighting, go after your dream, go after what you want with life. All of those in many ways can be opposed to what we've actually been called to do, which is being immersed in a community soaked and transformed by other believers, brothers and sisters around us, that we're going to say, you know what? I am in your life. You are in my life. No take backs. Because the good, the bad, and the ugly, going to happen. Are we going to walk through it together? By the grace of God, yes. By the grace of God, we're going to do this. But it's going to have to be because we are intentional. And it's going to be because we have grace with one another, because we have mercy, because we really do love each other and want to love each other more and more and more like our Father God. The moment we get our eyes off the heart of God and the love of God, it's, it's impossible to create this kind of community because it requires so much grace. And it's so uncomfortable sometimes, but it's also so much fun sometimes. And we really get to learn how to enjoy each other's differences and be better because of them. So this is the third baptism, soaked and transformed by people. This is one of Wellspring's top priorities. As I've already mentioned, we are called to be an immersive, interactive community, right? We're not perfect, but we're intentional, and I think we're doing okay. So the three-in-one baptism is progressive. Baptism in water, <coughs> baptism in the Holy Spirit, and baptism in the body. Now, as we look at those three things, water, spirit, body. We also see the progressive nature of baptisms as, as we look at the one who ministers it and in what it's ministered. So I also created this great equation for you guys, as you can see behind me. I like one plus one equals two. And so often when I see processes in the Bible, I write them down as equations and it helps me. It just connects with my brain. That's the way I think. So when I took these ideas, I put minister, minister plus element equals results. Because often when we're talking about each baptism, we're talking about a result also. Okay? So the first water baptism, we have a servant of the Lord. In the Bible, all of us are servants of the Lord. All of us are kings and priests, right? Right. Okay. So if you tell somebody about Jesus and they say, I want to be baptized, you can baptize them. I release you. Okay? <laughs> the first baptism, this, you have the servant of the Lord plus water equals immersed in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the second one, you have Jesus plus, instead of water, you now have the Holy Spirit, and you now have immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one that sends that out. But also, often you see it still portrayed in the natural, in the Bible, you see one believer putting their hand on someone else. It says laying on of hands. That's one of the also six basic principles, right? Laying on of hands. There's some type of weird, unexplainable transmission that happens by faith when you put your hand on another person and believe that the Holy Spirit, who is continually filling you, is now going to fill this person. You just get to be a, a hose. So Jesus plus Holy Spirit immersed in the Holy Spirit. And then the third one, it's the Holy Spirit that then takes you, the believer, and immerses you in what? The body. People, right. <laughs> so it's the Holy Spirit who takes the person, surrounds them with other people, and then from that, you are immersed in the body, the church family. So we call this a three-in-one baptism because it's never God's intention that you only experience one of those. It's His intention that you experience all of them. And just like we have a trinity that is a three-in-one kind of God, we also have this baptism that three of three things happen differently, but all connect in the same way. So number one, the Father sent the Son to atone for our sins and restore intimacy. Number two, the Son sent the Holy Spirit to empower the church and develop intimacy. So we have restore intimacy, and then through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have develop intimacy, and then the Holy Spirit sends the church to testify of the kingdom of God and demonstrate intimacy. All three baptisms, they're immersive, because there are all illustrations of intimacy. Mm -hmm. 
Intimacy is immersion in other people's lives. Intimacy with God is immersion in God. It means you are becoming one. What does it say when a husband and wife get married? They become one. one. And that's a picture of Jesus Christ in the church. Mm -hmm. Every immersion is a picture of intimacy, of relationship. And so we're baptized into Jesus to restore intimacy. Baptized in the Holy Spirit to develop that intimacy. Baptized in the, in the church to demonstrate the intimacy. So when people come and hang out with us, they should say, wait a second, this is what intimacy is supposed to look like. So what I want to do is I want us to talk a little bit together and break into smaller groups. The three questions that I want us to talk about are, number one, a common tactic of the enemy is to make you think parts of your old, the old you are still alive. Do you need to have a funeral service for anything in particular? That's a great question to just talk about in a small group. Number two, what fruit of the Spirit can you see being produced in your life? What gift of the Spirit are you operating in by faith? And number three, are you allowing yourself to be immersed in church relationships? How can you go deeper? Let's break up into groups of four or five and actually discuss these together. All right, let me pray for you guys. Lord, thank you. You're here among us. Thank you, Father. Right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just fill up this room. Fill up this room. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us up and overflow. And as we sit and have conversations, may every, every small group be an overflowing of you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you'd bring revelation, bring truth, bring honesty, and bring grace and love, God. That no one here has to perform for anything. We're just here to experience what you died on the cross to provide for us what you poured out the Holy Spirit to bring into us, and what you called us to be as a church, as your spiritual family. Thank you, Lord. I bless this group in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.